Do you yearn for travel that involves outdoor adventure and learning? I do. I also have a passion for all things farming and agriculture. I've traveled to exotic jungles to learn about growing chocolate. I even once owned my own organic vegetable and sunflower farm. And now I'm planning my journey back to agriculture. Agritourism, defined as travel that involves some type of agricultural experience. Agritourism is all about entertaining. But the marketing strategist in me knows that, at its core, agritourism is really about educating, and education affects change. My Future Farm needs to deliver a profound experience to all of its visitors. It needs to educate people about food, health, and climate. Join me to learn from experienced agritourism farmers and entrepreneurs and help me build my future farm strategy. And who knows? Maybe one day soon you'll find yourself in a tropical jungle cutting open cacao pods with a machete or savoring an outdoor plant-to-plate community dinner with 100 guests at a farm in Illinois. So let's tap into the agritourist in you. Welcome to the Agritourist Podcast. This is your host, Jen Ross. Steve and Sandy are the inspiring founders of East Tennessee Homestead Alliance. Sandy reached out to me about the podcast a few months ago. We ended up speaking on the phone about homesteading and what it really is all about. Many people, including myself, who is close to farming and all about sustainability, have this impression of homesteading as a far-reaching goal that we would not be capable of doing or achieving in our current environments. That you need to be living out in the boonies without electricity to even be considered a homesteader. Well, Sandy's description of homesteading is not that at all. She basically broke homesteading down to a simple definition. Homesteading is all about keeping a steady home. She feels that anyone can homestead and integrate homesteading regardless of their living situation and environment. I thought that her definition was brilliant and creates a sense of, I can do this. So Steve and Sandy are doing just that. They are teaching people how to homestead through their own life learnings and mastery and through the network they have formed in East Tennessee. And how does this tie into agritourism? Well, it ties in in many ways, but most importantly through education, through programs, retreats, alliance events, and most importantly, through how Steve and Sandy live their own lives. Steve and Sandy each have inspiring and humbling stories about how they came together and have spent over 39 years making each day count. I hope you are left with a feeling of inspiration and exhilaration after listening to my chat with Steve and Sandy. Hey there. Hello. This is my husband, Steve. Hello. Hi, Steve. Heard a lot about you. <laughs> I, again, heard a lot about you as well. All good. So wh- how, how's the weather there? <laughs> I was like concerned when I was hearing all the chaos. Yeah. Uh, So right where we're located, we, you know, lots of rain. We're on the lake, so they do raise our water. So it is up pretty high, but we didn't get what like the Northeast got. Um, My daughter's over in just over the border in North Carolina. They got hit really bad out there. I mean, obviously Asheville, she's like 45 minutes from Asheville. So they've been without power, their creek rose so much they couldn't get out, you know, stuff like that. But they're all safe, which is wonderful. Um, her and her her husband's family, they're all safe. His sister lives kind of down in this valley. They did have quite a bit of damage to their, uh, took on a lot of water to their home. But the the destruction is yeah. beyond anything, just beyond what you could even just imagine, like people sitting on top of their roofs and they're caving away and they're watching their children go downstream. And, you know, I mean, just, it's like, makes me just speechless. <laughs> yeah. So we're just thankful that where our kids are um, and where their houses are kind of located are like up a little bit. So, um, but there's a lot of places, you know, up Eastern Tennessee that they, they're up in the mountains, but these dams just couldn't hold back the water and just flooded the towns and there's just nothing left. Huh. Yeah. It's crazy. Mother nature. Pretty scary. It, it so. really is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Water so- and fire are two very comforting things and two very destructive <laughs> things. Exactly. Exactly. Really scary stuff though. Uh, we just keep hearing, it just seems, it just feels like it's getting more intense, though. 
it just keeps getting more intense and more intense. So uh, I don't know. So how is everything going other than the storm? <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, it's going well. East Tennessee Homestead Alliance has been going well. Everything that we've been, you know, pushing forward has gone well. The festival was great. Um, we have rebranded ourselves. And so we have, and you and I had talked about that a little bit. So we have a brand new website coming out with Steve and Sandy. And that's really going to house everything that we're passionate about, as well as the Alliance also. Uh, so we're real excited about getting that up and off the ground and being able to kind of plug in the things that we need to plug into there. Excellent. So I want to back up a little, but actually I want to start with a generic question. So obviously you both, Steve and Sandy, are both hosting the East Tennessee Homestead Alliance. We're going to talk about what that is, but for each of you, I'd like you each to define, and I do want to go back to your stories and talk a little bit about how each of you came together. Um, um, you know, you've been married a long time with kids and grandchildren and a lot going on. So I, I really want to hear those stories. Um, homesteading, what is it to each of you? What does it mean to each of you? Because I know that, um, Sandy, we spoke about this and, you know, that the concept or the perception of homesteading varies a lot. Um, I know you had a nice definition of it. So why don't, Sandy, why don't we start with you and tell me about what it means to you and then we'll set the stage from there. Go ahead. Okay. So like you said, and like we've talked about before, homesteading is a subjective term. I believe it's very relative because it depends on where you live and what people view as homesteading. Let's talk about the general term. The general term of homesteading, people see it as as soon as you hear that word, you automatically think acreage, livestock, sustainability, putting up your own food, you know, food preservation, and plugging out or unplugging out of the matrix. So that's kind of like the broad term I feel like the general public sees as homesteading. One of the things that I'm really trying to help others open up and have a different mindset about is that homesteading is just steading the home. So the word homesteading, right? You are steading, which means to make steady your home. And if you think about that, even in light of what, what has just happened around here with, with the hurricane and everything, that's unsteady, right? So this idea of making your home steady in a sense of being solid, grounded, sufficient, reliant, sustainable, whatever that means to you, right? So for me to be able, you know, some people will say to me, well, you're not a homesteader if you don't have five acres or more and you can be sustainable and you can have livestock. But then where does that leave the person that's in an apartment in New York City or in California who really longs for this, but feels like they can never have it unless they go out and have land? So I think there just needs to be a paradigm shift with that. And that's really part of... Uh, you know, equipping this next generation is you can stead your home no matter where you're at. If you're in an apartment, yeah. if you're in the city or in the country, wherever. So that's kind of my take on it. Let's see what my husband has to say, though. Yes, I definitely. <laughs> Come on, Steve, you're up. <laughs> you want to hear this? <laughs> okay. Well, I grew up in the 60s and 70s and on a 40 acre farm. And back then we called it farming. <laughs> we were farmers. Yeah. Now we call it homesteading. So <laughs> homesteading sounds way better. <laughs> so um, it was a very challenging time of my life. Uh, we There was no money. My parents didn't like each other much, and they didn't like their kids much either. And so it wasn't a pleasant experience. You worked 55, six days a week, and that's all you did. And it wasn't, it was survival. That was, we ate good. I will say that we ate very well. What so we, kind of farm was it? What kind, we had livestock, um, almost pretty close to a sustainable farm between, because back then you didn't waste anything. You know, um, we had livestock, horses, um, orchards, crops, corn, massive gardens with every vegetable and that nice. you can think of and all of that. And it was great as far as eating good. And, you know, had it been a better family experience, I might have enjoyed it more. But anyway, um, everything you touched, you had to fix it before you could use it. And winters were cold and the summers were hot. And and so um, 
Not so much. <laughs> so, so what do you, how do you define homesteading? <laughs> so what I'm going to define homesteading as, and don't misunderstand me, I believe in being prepared. I, we always have been. Just take out the agricultural part of it because I have a little PTSD for it. <laughs> I don't know if he's the best person right. to ask what well, homesteading you know, is. <laughs> when people ask me, do I love doing this? No, I do it because I love my wife. <laughs> so I'm I'm defining, I'm setting a stage so that I could give a better description of it. <laughs> so anyway, um homesteading. Do I believe in being prepared? Absolutely. Should do do I believe in being um, financially, physically um, sustainable as far as um, having provisions, that sort of thing. Absolutely. And being able to do everything yourself, um, that would be my idea. Mm -hmm. Now, I set my wife up with a beautiful garden mm -hmm. <laughs> and a, you know, a chicken coop and all that. But that's that's where my line, mm -hmm. my <laughs> position starts and stops. <laughs> he does yeah, but you're... I, I, yeah, he's building everything. So. I, 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 <laughs> he builds it so I can work it, right? So this is homesteading, right? If you find someone to build it, you know, you can work it. It, it takes what a team. Yeah, team effort. Do, do I have chickens? No, I don't have chickens. My wife has chickens. <laughs> but I mean that in a in a very kind yes. hearted way. But and interestingly enough, as I have found, is like I enjoy landscaping and flowers. I mean, I will go out and water those and take care of them and everything. And I, he's I, a girl at heart. I know. I, I think it's something that's more pleasant to for my PTSD or something. <laughs> no, I like the balance. And yeah. I think, Sandy, the way you diffuse the homesteading word, I think, is important because I think it's an intimidating. When people hear homesteading, they're like, I could never do that. Many people, you know, some people are yearning for it, but a lot of people are just like they they watch those shows on TV and they're like, no way, you know, yeah. but I like the way you brought, you know, you, you can just bring it to a New York City apartment. It doesn't have to be that that definition that we see on TV or that we hear about that everything is, you know, self-sustainable and and, you know, there's no reliance on it. You know, so I, I just I really appreciated when we first spoke and how you define that. I think that's really, really important. That message needs, you know, um, and I think if you can get that message across, I think a lot more people will be open to the concepts that are, you know, that you're bringing forth here. Absolutely. And I think it's super important for that too, because just like you said, so many people look at what's being portrayed as the only definition of homesteading and it, they automatically take a step back and say, well, okay, I guess I'll never do that. And exactly. so then instead of trying new things or becoming more sustainable, they just throw their hands in the air and, and they quit. And so hopefully our goal really is to help people see that is your waiting room can be your classroom. If you're in a New York City apartment and you really want land, do what you can in your own home to make your life a little bit more sustainable, a little bit less connected to the, the grid, if you will, or, you know, to being reliant upon outside sources. So I have this saying, like, are you outsourcing your life all the time? And there's areas in our life that we might have to outsource. Maybe I don't want to be my own brain surgeon, you know, uh, so I'll outsource that. I don't want you to be in mine. <laughs> <laughs> but if I want to have that fresh break, baked bread, or if I want to you know, have my own honey, right? I'm going to find ways in which to become more sustainable in those arenas. Right. Yeah. Yep. So let's, Steve, let's go back to you on this. So 40 acre farm, obviously there were some challenges to growing up there. Um, I guess what, what did you learn from that? What did you take away from that experience? Because obviously some of those, you know, difficulties in life, you know, bring us to our next steps. And um, I guess, what are some of the things that you gleaned from that experience, that early experience being on the farm? That's a great question. And it deserves an, a well-deserved answer. Um, a lot of great things, work ethic, um, how to be resourceful, how to learn to do things yourself, um, how to do it on a small budget, how to have integrity with your products because you know we had a <clears throat> it was a farm that we had a fruit stand and you know we sold a lot of our, our products and things 
So everything, a great work ethic. And I took that same um, things that I learned from that and I applied it to my business world in construction. Yeah. And I succeeded very well at it because mm -hmm. I learned that, you know what, I know how to work harder than the next guy mm -hmm. and how to be more resourceful and how to do quality you know, work. Because one thing my father did demand was, you know, if you're going to do it, do it well. Right. And so yeah. I, I learned a lot of great mechanical skills because you didn't outsource anything. You had to learn to do all that yourself. And when I was a kid, my dad was always calling me out of five children. He was like, hey, Steve, come give me a hand. <laughs> and I was like, I'd really like to go play baseball. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was too young and they wouldn't let me play anyway. <laughs> So how long were you on the farm for? Till what age? I was there till uh till about 16, 17. And then where did you go from? I'm I'm actually I wanna get you guys together eventually. So so where <laughs> okay. did you yeah, where did you um, um you, you be, have an interest? Yeah, you yeah. yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> Part of his story. Okay, so I had a lot as of, long as you want to tell. <laughs> I okay. don't want to push. <laughs> I had a lot of testosterone and a lot of anger, and so it got me in a lot of trouble with the law. And so I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Um, uh, how much detail should I? No. Whatever you're well, comfortable. Okay. I, I ended up doing a couple of years worth of time as a youth offender for armed robbery, stealing cars, and all kind of crazy stuff. And it was just, I was just looking to feel alive, to, to, to be honest, because mm -hmm. when you grow up with a narcissist father who beats the snot out of everybody, and back then, beating your wife and kids was just, seemed like it was normal. Not normal, but it was commonplace. commonplace. Mm -hmm. And so, um, from there, I ended up on the street for a long time, for a couple of years. And then I finally got working and um, and I did very well at it. And I learned lots of different skills from heating and cooling to landscaping to um, carpentry. Carpentry to going into the restaurant business for several years. That done in, um, yeah. for, uh, hold on, hold on one second. So what made the switch? I mean, you were on this not so great trajectory and then... What what was it that made you say, I want to learn? I want to do something. Um, I was a drug addict too. And I just my life I could just see it. There wasn't I had no hope. And I was um I would say some people, some friends that came into my life. And prior to that, um I didn't attract very good friends. You know, it was more of the same thing of people that were just drug addicts and and going nowhere, going nowhere fast. And I was at this job and these good kids were like, they came into the, the heating and cooling company I was working at and they were like, wanted to be my friend. And I was like, do you have brain damage? <laughs> Most people run <laughs> because usually something bad is going to happen. I just bad things happen. I couldn't, I couldn't avoid them to save my life. Um, and that started a, a role. And then my parents were like, you know, they had become, they we grew up in a Catholic church and the charismatic movement had come through and they were like, well, we've been praying for it. We just committed you over to the Lord. And I was just like, okay, well, that's fine. And I was like, what'd you do that for? Now you got me, him on my back too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm trying to keep this in a nutshell, but eventually then when I was working and I was still, I was sitting in church with a friend of mine and he says, you want to go to Florida? And I says, yeah, why not? I, mm -hmm. I was always up for an adventure. Um, so we moved to Florida for three months during the winter. You know, we took our motorcycles down. And prior to that, we'd traveled the country a little bit with our motorcycles and stuff. And uh, I had a great time. And then I came back and I says, and eventually we moved back. And then I was, uh, you, you, want to, you want me to connect us? No, not yet. You're going to stop right there. <laughs> Sandy? I want to let's talk about your backstory because it was very different. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so very different. talk about you were an athlete. So uh -huh. 
Yeah. Talk so to I me. Grew, okay. I grew up in a single family home and I was in at an early age, tumbling all over the floors. My mom said, I got to do something with this kid, stuck me in gymnastics. And I was only three and I excelled really quickly. By the time I was nine, I was competing at a fairly high level and moved up through the levels pretty quickly. By the time I was 14, I was an elite gymnast and was getting ready to go train at um, an Olympic camp when I got injured. And so I had spent pretty much, you know, up until 14 in the gym, four hours a day, five days a week, six days a week if we had meets. And so that was it. You know, I went to school. I got picked up from school. We went straight to the gym, did our homework on the gym floor for 30 minutes. And then we worked out for four hours and came home, went to bed and, you know, Pete and repeat. So that's all I did. I didn't have any other kind of life out of that. I didn't have any other sports, you know, nothing. Injured out at 14, went back into the sport at 15 or tried to, and it just wasn't, it wasn't coming. So I decided to go into coaching and I began to coach at the gym that I had competed out of. And so- Hold on one sec. So when that injury happened, what were you feeling at the time? Uh, well, I can tell you exactly what I felt. I felt like, well, for starters, I came out of surgery because I had to have surgery on my knee, came out of surgery. And the doctor said, well, before you even got in the room, I thought they took my leg off because I couldn't feel it. So of course, reminded me, I'm 14 years old and this was a brand new type of surgery. They'd never done it before. It was arthroscopy surgery back in the eighties. So I was kind of a guinea pig. Get out of surgery. I thought they had taken my leg off. So I was really afraid to even like reach down to try to touch my leg or whatever. Doctor came in and said, you will have no, you're done. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you don't, it doesn't register to you right at that second. Because all you can think is, I think because of the resilience I had as a kid, all I could think was, no, I'm not. You're not going to tell me I'm done. You know, it's like you go through those stages of like, you're fighting it. And then you realize you, it took me like six weeks to recover. During that recovery time, I realized I'm done. I'm not going to be able to go forward with this and do this. And that was really devastating because I had lived for 11 years. That's all I did. I ate, slept, and breathed it. That was it. So yeah, um, that was pretty devastating at 14. And I, I made reconciliation with that probably around 18 years old, uh, but not at 14. That was hard. Yeah. Middle school years for a woman, especially. That's a tough time. Yeah, it was. So. Especially when your identity, you know, my identity was all wrapped up in that. That's who I was. Yeah. I was an elite athlete. You know, there wasn't anything outside of that. So yeah. when that gets taken from you, you've got to reinvent yourself, you know, and at 14, how many 14 year olds as can a teenager? Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't, that word doesn't even exist. Right. So, right, yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. started coaching? I did. I went back into the gym, started coaching, ended up coaching a lot of the gymnasts that I was competing with. And I stayed a coach there for the next four or five years. I think until Steve and I met when I was about 18 and a half, 19, Actually, I guess about until almost 20. So about six years, I, I continued coaching. Yeah. Okay. So how did you meet? <laughs> okay. Wait, I got to back up one second. Oh. I got to finish my story. Can I do that? Or you Yes, know? absolutely. <laughs> There's no rules here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while, while I'm in Florida and I met some good friends and stuff, and then I ended up meeting up with a childhood friend down in Miami. Well, and he's got this boat that he's wanting to restore and everything. They lived on the ocean. And I was like, and it was kind of cool. He's paying me pretty good money back in the day. And I had been straight for a little while. I hadn't done drugs in probably hmm, six months or so. And I'm there working and he comes in one day and he tosses a bag of weed on the table. And I go, hmm. Hmm. And I picked it up and put it in my pocket. And that was the worst thing I ever did. And possibly the best thing I ever did. But anyway, so here I was, I was, I fell headlong back into it again. And I went back to West Palm Beach where my friend was, that we had a, a roommate together. And I went to church one night. It was on a Wednesday night. It was back in 1982. 
And I was very frustrated with my life because I had no control over my addiction or my compulsion, to be honest. Okay. Um, and we walked into church and it was these little churches and it was the standing room only and barely get in the door. And I opened the door and there was no way to even get in. And I turned to walk around, turned to walk away and an usher grabs my arm and says, we have a front row seat. <laughs> <laughs> I says, no, you don't. <laughs> I don't want to hide back here. <laughs> you know, where they'd set up chairs in the front. And anyway, um, I don't know what it was. I was just at a point in my life where I had no control and I was so um, confused and desperate. And I just um, had made a commitment to the Lord that day. And that was in 1982, and I've never turned back since. Mm -hmm. So you sat in the front row seat? Yes. You really <laughs> oh, I did. I, I yeah. sat in the front row seat, and he had an altar call, and I just fell on my face. And I says, Lord, you either got to change something in me, or I'm, I'm, out, I'm, of here. I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. Yeah. And a, a, a miracle <laughs> happened. Yeah. It changed me. And that's been... Oh, since he... However many years? 40, 45 years ago, <laughs> something like that. Wow. 42 years ago. And from that day forward, you know, it was a progression of um, learning, but freedom came almost instantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's so, where we met. That's where we met. And that's that very same church. Yeah. Wow. I, because I, he ended up moving to the town I was in. So I, he had gone to that church first, ended up getting involved with the church, then became a band member. He was playing the drums. And played. I, I saw her walk in one day and I go, oh, that was the nice thing about sitting on stage is you could see all the girls coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, wow, I like that one. <laughs> yeah, that one. That one right there. Okay. And I had to meet her three times before she remembered me. And <laughs> like, hi, I'm Steve. I'm like, hey, hey nice to meet you. you. Remember like, me? I met you. Okay. Like, remember we met? And then I says, hey. And, and then I set up a double date with her boyfriend to steal her. <laughs> Yeah, are you serious? <laughs> so That's I'm funny. dating this guy. I go to this church. I'm dating this other. I don't really want to be in this relationship. He's actually dating someone else too at the time. Some girl. Oh, okay. I didn't want to be. I was wasting yeah. my time. So I'm at church. I had, you know, it was brand new to me. Like I kind of sort of grew up in church, but like this particular church, the way they talked and whatever was totally new to me. Anyhow, we meet takes him three times to actually introduce himself to me over three different occasions. And finally, I remember who he is. And, and then he, I wait, I said, I said, Hey, you want to go get ice cream? She says, I don't like ice cream. I was like, everybody, <laughs> you're not making this easy. Everybody on the planet likes ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so then he invites me, my boyfriend with him and his girlfriend to a concert. So I've never been to a concert before in my entire life ever. Cause remember I'm only 18 at this point. I've only been out of the gym for four years. And in those four years, I was coaching all these kids, you know, so I, my life was still kind of the same. So we go to this concert and I'm like bopping around like this teeny bopper, you know, ah, you know, and he's over here like, I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, I, mean, I brought the grandfather, I, you know, <laughs> I'm eight years older. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Who oh, brought I, the grandfather? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> so we leave the concert and, you know, we go back our separate ways, whatever. And I'm still dating the same guy. He's still dating the same girl. And he meets me up in the parking lot one day. And all four of us are talking. He hands me this little cassette tape. And he's like being really super sweet, super kind, all this stuff. And But I'm not thinking anything of it. Well, shortly after that, I end up breaking up with my boyfriend. I just knew it was not. It was just like he was just a distraction, whatever. And he breaks up with his girlfriend and he calls me out on a date. So we ended up going out. We met like in, in June of 84, 85. And then we like in November is when we went on our, our actual first date. And then from there, we just became best friends. We, we spent every waking moment together. We weren't even necessarily dating. I wasn't looking for a boyfriend. I was not even interested, but I enjoyed his company. I enjoyed that he was a man. You know, I was 18. He was 25. Right? And she kissed me first. <laughs> I'm like, what'd you do that for? <laughs> I'm trying to protect you from uh, from me. <laughs> I do believe that, our, though. <laughs> our little love story in a nutshell, yeah. 
And so, you know, six months after we met, we got engaged and then we were going to get married shortly after that. And he called the wedding off twice. He postponed it. He didn't call it off. He postponed it twice. Uh, just, you know, I was young. I was young. I had all these picket fence ideas, you know, and he was like, yeah, and I just want to make sure I got her whole heart, you know? So, um, from start to finish, it was like 18 months from the time we met to the time we got married was 18 months. Um, and now it's been almost 40 years. Uh, my life began 40 years ago. Yeah. No question about it. That's amazing. And we'll talk about what sustains that. Um, <laughs> so, so you moved though from Florida back to the farm, correct? We did <laughs> for a period of time. <laughs> Yeah. To, the school, to, the, to the school of dirt. The school of dirt. That's right. But we were, we were, I wasn't thinking of it in that respect, right? In my mind, I'm like, I've never been anywhere. We can go up there and we're going to be Bible students, you know, and there needed to be some healing with him and his dad and whatever, whatever. So I'm like, let's just go for a year or two. We don't, we have our own business. We only had one little boy at the time and we're kind of adventurous like that. Like, Sure, let's do that. You know, we really felt it was a call too. So we did. We moved back to the farm. Now the farm was no longer working at that point. It was um his mom still did some gardening and she uh would go buy stuff from the markets and put up t I mean, oh my gosh, so many canned, you know, she would can all our food. Uh so, you know, a lot of none of that stuff died with with the farm, but um that really wasn't the goal for going back. And of course, Steve was always like, I will never go back there. Ever. I was like, you want to do what? Yeah. You want to go where? This is my family you're talking about. This yeah. is that. Yeah. Do you understand this? We're selling everything and we're going, you know, we literally sold everything we had and left in a little tiny truck with our little guy. And that's what we did. And we moved up there again with the idea of maybe being a year, maybe three, we thought, maybe. And, you know, 25 years later, we were still there, you know, through all that had um, a ton of stories, obviously, through all that. So, yeah. Steve, how did you feel about going back? Oh, I, I, mm -hmm. a lot of emotions, as, as you can imagine. Um, and then having my wife and my child living in the same house. And it was it was a healing time of reconciliation because when you when you grow up in a very highly abusive home your um the thought of even touching my father was didn't even exist in my mind let alone to be vulnerable or to establish some kind of relationship and the interesting thing about it is when i was in that front row and i had surrendered my heart to the lord that evening one of the things the Lord put on my heart that I was going to be instrumental in my father's passing. And I kind of hid that in my heart for 30 some years. And so uh, where did we leave off? So how did you feel about going back? We can oh, that part of the story. Okay. Yes. It was, it was bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And, and at the same time, while I was there, the Lord put on my heart because I had, gotten some construction skills and my and the house was in in disrepair, fall, in disrepair yeah. severely mm -hmm. and the lord put on my heart to fix it and all my friends that were in construction i say that's a piece of junk what are you doing and i was like i know it is but this is what i have to do and we took a sow's ear and made a silk purse out of it but in the beauty of that story too jen is that whenever god's doing a work in your life he always starts with the foundation he doesn't start with the extraneous things. He always gets to the foundation. And with that house, in order to restore that home, Steve had to lift the actual house off the foundation, suspend it, repair the foundation, and put the house back on. And that's just a great word picture for what he began to do in his life right. and in his father's life was that he had to repair that foundation spiritually between the two of them. And so this work of the house was really hugely connected to that. It was at the time, it was one of the most difficult construction project restorations I'd done um, just because of the extensive. Of that. But at the same time, it was a picture of the relationship with my father as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sandy, did you realize 
the bigness of what it meant to go back there at the time? Like, did you? Not at all, yeah. because, you know, grow, the way Steve grew up and the stories that he had were really closely vested to him. And a lot of things he did not share with me over those years. I think some of it was to honor his parents. Some of it was just too painful. And so I was young. I was 20. You know, I grew up, I didn't grow up around abuse. I didn't grow up in any of that. So I don't, I really don't believe I had a total understanding of what he lived through and escaped from. And so to me, it was like, well, yeah, it's your mom, you know, it's your dad. Like, let's go back here, whatever, you know? So I, I went very naively, I think, but I also knew I'm the kind of person when I really st strongly sense that we're supposed to do something, I, to sometimes to my great demise, I don't let it go. And so there was this uh, sense of like, we are supposed to go. Like, I don't know why, but we're just supposed to go. And he, all he could think of is, I'm heading back to hell, yeah. you know, but the beauty of my husband is that he's always protecting me. So I think a lot of him not sharing some of these things was a protective measure for me. And I don't know if I would have gone, if I would have really known the depth of abuse, you know, that had happened. Right. There. Yeah. Now, so you though, you had your own learning experiences going on with your mother-in-law and mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that you are learning that you've brought forth now into mm -hmm. your life and to your family and to the you know alliance that you've created so tell me a little bit about that experience sure so my we lived when we moved there of course steve's rebuilding the home so we lived in a trailer on the property for a while and we would share the kitchen and then eventually he restored the attic in the house and we lived up in the actual attic and we'd walk down we didn't have a kitchen. So we'd always be in the kitchen. And that's where obviously she spent a lot of her time. And by this point, we had two kids now. And because, you know, the, let's go back to the whole, what is homesteading? For her, that was just the way she lived, right? So she sewed all their clothes. She canned all their food. She was great at recycle, reuse, reduce. Like that was just the way of life for her. So by living there, it wasn't like I looked at her and go and said, teach me all this. I just integrated myself into what her daily habits already were. And while she's doing them, of course, now I'm like, I want to learn this. Oh, this is great. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know, you know, like I swore off all green vegetables. The only green thing I would eat would be green jello, you know? So like this whole idea of having a garden and where your food comes from. And now you can can it and you can go downstairs and pull it off the shelf. I mean, that was just so big to me and so otherworldly to me. I just, I lived off of TV dinners and Hormel chili all, you know, forever. Bless my mom. She could cook great, but I wasn't having it, you know? So I, so I like to call it my mom, my mother-in-law's school of dirt because she really did take me in and just was so patient with me taught me everything there is to know about homesteading and farming and just living a sustainable life. Yeah. Excellent. So you spent how long, how long were you there? Seven. We lived in that house eight years in the house, wow. eight years. And then we moved out and we renovated another little house just at the end of that street. And then we actually bought the property that we ended up all living on and we built multi-generational homes there for his parents and us and lived there the remainder of our 18, 19 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So bring me forward um, to more current times. Well, so we moved out of Michigan. Well, let's back up real quick before we get to the current all that healing that we talked about that needed to take place did end up happening. Steve restored that home. The relation now remember we were there 25 years, so it wasn't overnight. It was a 25 year long that journey. Is, that is a long time. <laughs> and <clears throat> interestingly enough, as now my dad was getting ill and we'd lived next door. I'd built two very nice homes. And you know, and one day as he was getting ill, I was just like 
I don't get it. You said I was going to be instrumental in his passing, but I realized something that I had to put an effort into something. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, it's going to magically happen. So he's getting more and more feeble. And so I'd say, hey, I'm just going to go over and see my dad and we'll go walk around the driveway. And he's out there with his walker and we're just talking about nothing. We had no depth. I mean, he taught me how to work and we had a great Working, working relationship yeah, we right. could do almost anything but as far as any depth of conversation it didn't exist and one day we're walking and he stops and he says did i ever apologize to you for um wait for it <laughs> and i said no dad you didn't and he says, well, I'm apologizing now. And interestingly enough, it came at a time in my life when I wasn't hanging my hat on it anymore. Because really, what my wife had done for my soul, so much healing had taken place from that. And anyway, then I says, uh, I wasn't letting him off that easy. <laughs> And I says, Dad, do you realize you destroyed five children and your wife? And I said, um, and then he started going, well, mm -hmm. look at the things you did. And I was like, I did those to get back at you. And then we're walking and I go, and we had taken in my brother, Dale, who had been severely beaten. And I, he was an alcoholic. And I says, Dad. Have you apologized to him? Well, that's a different story. And anyway, so shortly after that, he had be started getting combatant as he was getting older. And we'd put him in a nursing home. And my wife and I would go visit him. And I'd go see him. And I, I actually could touch him. And i say, Dad, how you doing today? And anyway, fast forward or... During that time, my mom comes to me and says, would you consider building your dad a casket? Because my mom grew up in that era where, you know, you laid out um, your, family, your members. family members in your house, in your living room. And she lived next door to a, a funeral home and a cemetery. So that was normal, normal, commonplace. And I was just like, oh, wow, that's kind of weird, mom. No. Um, <laughs> and I thought about it. I kept, you know, I'd held on to it. And then we were there you know, visiting and my father for several months and he was starting to decline. And then one day we were there and um, I, I, we got a call that, you know, he's taking a turn and you may want to come down. So we went down and sure enough. Um, but so we were there in the morning and then they said he's probably going to pass by the evening. So I told my wife, I says, we need to go home and build that casket. So I had this wood that we'd harvested on the property for my hardwood floors. And I had had a bunch of that and I had a shop set up. So it was, and then we had all of my kids were there, all five of our kids. And I was like, and we're going to build this casket. You know, it's just a simple pine box. Pine kind of, box. Yeah. And we we're laying out on the floor and getting measurements and trying to figure all this out and everything. And we built this box and then the girls, my wife and the girls had made this little liner in it and everything. And then after I built it, I says, how big is that cement vault? Because <laughs> I got to make sure it fits in that vault. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to put handles on it. And I says, oh, and I called him. I said, sure enough, it was like very, very tight. And so we'd gone back to the nursing home and had the casket built. I mean, I just had it in the garage there. And then if you've ever had the privilege of um, watching um, somebody pass from this life to the next, it's, it's very it's um, humbling. It's humbling. And um, when you can almost physically see a spirit, somebody's spirit leave their body mm -hmm. and it was humbling and very awakening. And it was very, uh, I was privileged to be able to participate in that. Mm -hmm. And for uh, my wife and my brother and my sister out of five kids were the only ones that could emotionally be there and to hold his hand and sing Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's bringing 
And then Steve, Steve closed his eyes for him. And it was just, it was such an honor to be able to have done that. And I really believe it's the only reason Steve could have done that was because he chose to do the hard things for 25 years. He chose to walk back into a prison and not allow it to shackle him any longer. Um, and that that's a huge testimony to the work of God in a man's life and the power of a healthy marriage to walk alongside that, you know? Um, so we ended up. It, um, the, the interesting part of it is though, we were all one, my wife was by my side. It was hundred percent in and myself, my brother and my sister walked away free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Two of the kids did not, but, um, but it was good to see, you know, that, and really the, you know, the, the, the uh, promise that he'd had 30 years ago that he'd be instrumental in his dad's passing. Nobody else had the courage to say to his dad, you need to, you need to make amends with your children. Nobody had that courage except for Steve. So I really believe God called us back there for that purpose. And, you know, hopefully we can get to come back on your podcast another day and talk about just how God's using that now in our lives to catapult us out um, to help other people realize that you, it, in the freedom that you're seeking, you sometimes have to walk back into that prison cell and make and face those things that were there so that you can have your freedom. And so that when that happened, when his dad did pass, we had actually knew like two years prior to that, that we were supposed to sell our home, but we couldn't understand why. And so this is going to bring us up to present. So when he passed, because we knew we were supposed to stay there until he passed, but then we felt the Lord telling us two years prior, it's time to sell your home. We put it up for sale. We're like, this is crazy. Like he's still alive. He ends up passing away. And within a year, our house sold, sold. And that's when, what brought us to the South. Our son actually happened to be down here getting, just getting out of um, the, yeah. the Marines and the other military. And we ended up in Tennessee and that's a whole nother story that we don't have to tell right now. But um, so that's how we ended up here. And his mom is still alive and she's still in the same homestead up there. The, the homestead that we built up there for her, we sold our side off to some great people. And then she has stayed up there with one of his brothers um, and his whole family still up there. But we came down here with our entire families. We got five kids. We now have um, 10 grandkids. And we kind of plunked down in this little tiny town. We had 67 acres up there. And we didn't know where we were going to go here. So we kind of looked at like, let's find a temporary spot, kind of sort of in this outskirts of the um, Knoxville area that we are. And let's just have a five-year plan. And we'll you know big, get bigger acreage, whatever. Because of course, our goal really... We came from 67 acres, so we certainly didn't, weren't thinking we were going to go back to like a little postage stamp, but we did. (laughs) Uh, So we're like on an acre and a quarter uh, at this little lake house. And then we ended up buying up four and a half other acres around us and our kids all live there. So we came down with the five kids, lived in our camper, uh, restored this home. And now we, you know, fast forward up into beginning to homestead on this home here. And even prior to having any animals, I still took all the same things that my mother-in-law taught me, you know, baking from scratch, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, sew my own clothes, sew the curtains, you know, like all that kind of stuff, you know, we still did it here. Uh, And then, yeah, so that's where we are. Tell me where you want me to go now. (laughs) You use the term, I want to talk about the Alliance, but I mean, your story is pretty amazing. And I think the message about having to kind of face those fears and those, those circumstances that you went through, a lot of people think they just need to move forward and not go backwards and not live in it again. Um, Obviously, you were in a different place when you went back. But I think that whole message is so important. Um, And I think that's kind of symbolic of your life and what's happened. Um, So, you know, I I think that's just at the core of this, from what I can see. Um, One of the terms you guys use, or Sandy, I know you've used wildcrafted life. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? I love it, but what does it mean? 
I think it probably means something different to everybody. So, you know, you hear the term, you have a well-crafted life, right? It's it, It's been well-crafted. We like the term wild-crafted because it's a little bit less in a box and a little bit more unconventional. Our lives have definitely been very wild-crafted with the the things that we've had to walk through in order to be who we are today. And so, and I don't know that it'll ever be well-crafted because we're always learning and growing and stretching and, you know, all the things. And so it's always been this idea of just being open to growth, being open to almost like plasticity, right? You know, like you, you got neuroplasticity of the brain. So it's almost like the sensor just being open to being stretched. And to me, that's very wild crafted and it's not, um, boxed crafted, if you will, or, you know, regimented or whatever. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, I want to talk about the Alliance. So what are you each doing now? Why so now? Oh, he wants to give was... a finish in a wild crafted. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> please go ahead. Down. I want to, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Wait, first of all, who came up with the term? Let's, which one of you came up with the term? Probably my wife, but it, it's interesting because my wife is a, she's a good girl with a wild side. Oh, I can <laughs> I tell. With a good side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't know, there's something about the word wild that I've always loved. And so all of my businesses have had that word in it. And it's just something I attach to. I just resonate with nature and being grounded. And it's just, everything's kind of wild, you know, it's not so boxed in or whatever. So and I liken it to being a child and having all of your dreams and passions and hopes and desires. And somewhere along the line, oftentimes those get crushed by either you or other people yeah. and refusing to allow that to happen mm -hmm. and going after life. I mean, with all of its um, passions, with all of its goals, with all of its desires, with all of its adventure and embracing it. And it's, and it's, it's embracing the journey doing that as well. Yeah. And the goal, when you get to the goal, it's just like, wow, the whole thing was just an adventure that you embrace the process as well as the goal. Yeah. So I think that's kind of like what we've in turn, you know, embodied in this whole idea of being wildcrafted. And we've had the privilege of doing, I could share with you numerous stories of things that we've been able to obtain on a very small budget and just because we wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I love the term. I, I, I absolutely love it. Um, I, it resonates with me. <laughs> so, oh, okay. um, totally. Um, so you, um, Steve, are you still doing contracting now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Sandy, what are you, uh, what are you doing? I know, cause you've done a lot of different things. So what yeah. are you doing right now? What's your focus right now? So my main focus, well, I have two focuses. So one is the Homestead Alliance. The other is I'm a personal trainer. So I'm a certified personal trainer and sports uh, performance specialist. So I do work individually with people in my gym. We have a gym on our property and I do personal training with them. I've been in the fitness industry, obviously, since I was little, because I was in gymnastics and I never really got out of it. I've always been a coach. I'm a coach at heart. I'm a teacher at heart. And so I've just taken that with me. So everywhere we've been, I've either taught fitness classes, boot camp classes, or I do personal training. And I still continue to do that. And then obviously we are working collectively together on building the Homestead Alliance organization um, so that we can continue to see people equipped in this next generation equipped for sustainability. So let's talk about that. Where, how did that start? Why did you see the need for something? First of all, I guess, talk about what you saw as the need and then what you actually formed. And we'll kind of talk about what's going on with that. Cause I think it's um, obviously you saw a tremendous need for this and people responded you know, yeah, very we, quickly. <laughs> they really did. I mean, it kind of took us both by surprise. I started to teach canning workshops and herbal workshops and things of that nature at a local exchange here in our town. At that time, 
I I was also putting stuff up on social media and I had a lady contact me who was a friend of this of the owner of this little exchange. And she said, "Hey, I want you to come out to my farm. I would love to be able to maybe teach some, you know, have you teach some of these classes or whatever out there." And I said, "Sure, I'd be happy to." Well, she's only like 15 minutes from me. She had a 75 acre horse farm. Oh, well, I got number one, I didn't even know she was there. And I got on this farm and I am a visionary. I'm a big picture person. I stepped on this farm and all I could think was, oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. I think we need to have a festival. It just like popped up. Well, the backstory to that was we had gone to our very first homestead festival the year prior. And I was so enamored with it. I didn't even know these things existed. We end up at this festival and I, we, I came home going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like we, I hope, I hope there's something near us like this. So end up teaching the classes, meet um, this young lady. She starts sharing with me what she wants to do. I get on the land. I'm like, ah, and we're going to shift off the workshops and we're going to talk about a festival. <laughs> And it just like started pouring out of me. It wasn't like I planned on doing that. It just kind of started pouring out. And she was beside herself excited. And she was like, oh my gosh, yes, we have to do this. Well, then I, I come home and I'm thinking, well, maybe they're already doing it here. And I'm I'm behind the dollar bill, you know. I couldn't see anything in our area in the East Tennessee region. So I said to Steve, so what do you think about a festival. He's like a festival for what? Like a homestead festival. What are you talking about? I'm like, well, I was just over there at this farm and 75 acres and yada, yada. And I think we could have a festival just like the one we went to. And okay. He stop. Said, and Steve said, <laughs> and Steve, no, I didn't. Steve thought. <laughs> See, we're, we're both visionaries and, but she's visionary King and I'm visionary steady. I'm the guy that's okay. How's um, all that going to happen? And I'm just like, I know I'm not how it's going to happen. Gonna <laughs> and I'm like, uh, she, she tends to jump in and and then figure out it's over her head, and I'm t I'm walking in slower. <laughs> or he's holding me up above the yeah. water, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's what he thought. Because <laughs> she's a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> so I work. I work kind of backwards. So I came home. I'm telling him, I, it wasn't a, hey, what do you think about it? It was, hey, guess what we're doing? And I just started to plan it. And I said, okay, first I need a name. I have no idea what this is. I need a name. And from there, all right, now, now I'm just going to, I'm going to go build a website. Okay. I have no idea if there's interest, nothing. I don't know what my brain does. So anyhow, I ended up talking to the young lady. I said, listen, this is what I'm thinking. You want to have it on the property? Yes, I'd love that. That's great. She has this beautiful wedding venue on there. And she said, uh, and I said, well, maybe we should find out if there's even interest before we get too invested in this. So we ended up throwing out like this little Farmstead Friends holiday event and invited whoever we could think of. Didn't even think we'd have 20 people. We ended up having 120. Wow. <laughs> like, oh, okay, I guess there's some interest here, you know. So we basically shared our vision for what we saw that the area could could use. And so from the time that I had actually spoke spoken to her and said, I think we should have a festival to the time of this was like maybe a two months or so. And in that time, I began to do a little market research, you know, is there anything out here? And why isn't there anything out here? And how can we bring it here, but not just be a festival? We didn't want it, in my mind, I didn't want it just a festival. I wanted an alliance. I wanted to be able to lock arms with local farms and cottage industries to come together and have representation for them. So that was the crux of that vision. And then we were able to share that with the community and they were all over it. They wanted it. I said, okay, do you guys want to have a festival then? And they were like, yes. And so I'm thinking, awesome. Well, now we got to, well, we thought we would have it at that location. Well, it ended up where we started to hear people saying like, you're going to have 500 or more people here. And she was like, I can't accommodate that many people here. So I had to really kind of scurry and pivot a little bit to find a new location, which we did. 
Uh, and we did end up having over 500 people at that first event. Wow. That's and, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> We really only had about four months to plan it. I say we, it was me. I had about four months to plan it. And because we were working around Joel Salatin's schedule, Joel and the venue schedule. Joel was who we wanted as our main uh, speaker. And he is the uh, Polyface Farms. He's like kind of the granddaddy of homesteading, of the homesteading movement, the modern homesteading movement. We really wanted him there. And that was the only weekend was in July that he could come. The hottest weekend of our entire lives at that festival. And, um, so we had those four months and we planned it and we put it on and it was a huge success from the feedback that we're getting. Uh, and from there, we've now been just working on getting a directory together, getting people put into the places where they need getting a better volunteer group so that I'm not the only one doing all, you know, everything. And, um, so that's kind of where we're at today. And we, our next festival will be next September. And I have a whole year to plan that. Excellent. So just give um, for for listeners, like what went on? Just give me some highlights from the festival. Sure. We had over 30 different speakers from all over. Oh. Most of them were from East Tennessee. So we did try to keep them kind of from the East Tennessee area. Joel was the only one I think that came out of the Virginia area. Uh, so we had over 30 speakers. We had over 15 different types of hands-on demonstrations we had vendors, we had food trucks, things like that. We had live bluegrass music. We had a kid zone. And um, some of the topics that we were covering were obviously anything re- regarding homesteading. So rotational grazing and chicken processing and how to run a homestead business, how to run a homestead agritourism business, um, you name it. I mean, it just went down the line. We had people coming up to us that were had been homesteading for a long time. We had others that had never homesteaded or had a dream of homesteading and the feedback that people would walk up and say, this was life-changing to us. We don't know why we've never had this here. And so that was very validating to know that what we were bringing to the forefront there was really changing people's lives and giving them just nuggets, treasure to go home with, you know, for $99, they got like a life-changing nugget to go home with and change the trajectory of their own homesteads um, or maybe a homestead they were dreaming of. Right. Steve, what was your take from the whole thing when you were experiencing it? What was your impression of what actually, what she pulled together? Uh, Well, actually we, she had done the, I did the infrastructure Mm -hmm. and she did all of the coordinating. So I, um, when you actually saw it happen and unfold, what were your thoughts? I, 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 we both love to teach. We both love to equip. And at that point, I was just like, I, and the feedback that we were getting was really positive and really um, life changing for some folks. So it was very invigorating. It was very um, welcoming because mm-hmm. for the most part, it was a labor of love. Mm-hmm. And for us to be able to get see the fruition of that was really worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. He did stand up on stage and said, I'm not here because I love homesteading. I'm here because I love my wife. <laughs> I was not make any bones about it. But I and it's also it, but it doesn't mean that I'm not a hundred percent all yeah. in. Yeah. It just means that. Uh, I got dragged here. No, just, <laughs> wow. I was going to say, well, it does mean you're a hundred percent all in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, think, so, I think he was pretty proud of, of how it all went down. Oh, I was, I was. T- and we, we were in the en- entertainment business for several years. So this was probably the biggest event we've hosted, but we'd hosted numerous other large events. So it wasn't anything new to us as far as the what to expect from it yeah. or the amount yeah, of work, work that, that goes that, into that it. Yeah. Definitely. Involved in it as well. Yeah. Um but and I I I knew going into it, my eyes were wide open as to what it would how much effort it was going to require. Yeah. He he knew that more than I did. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your vision for next steps with the organization? What do you want to happen with it? Again, I'm I'm the infrastructure guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Uh, I think, honestly, it's really just to continue to create that community, that sense of community, and to help 
create that idea of equipping this next generation. So one of the things that we're really finding is that farms are falling away by the by the minute. The the average farmer is 65 to 70 years old and they're getting out of farming and their kids don't want it, right? So we're losing a lot of the heritage skills that could have been passed down for so long and we're losing those. And so our hope really is to, because we love to teach, we want to see this next generation pick up the mantle, continue on with this idea of whether you want to farm or whether you simply just want to be more resilient in your own home, uh, but not to be so dependent on outsourcing your life to everything and to everybody. Uh, I think it's so important. We're living in a day and age where we don't know if those outsource options will even be available anymore. And so that's really the hope for this we would love to see it grow, not because we want numbers, but because we know that the impact is reaching where it needs to reach. Yep. Are there other alliances throughout the U.S. that you've connected with? Similar to what you're doing, they may not be called an alliance, I guess. Oh, oh yeah. Like- oh, sure. So, you know, there's a homestead festival getting ready to happen in a couple of weeks out in Virginia. They have theirs every, this is like their sixth or seventh. Uh, the one that we went and visited, it, which is in Western Tennessee, uh, this is their third or fourth. So yes, we've connected with the leaders that are there. Right. There's we will actually be. Um, they've asked us to come speak at some of these other ones, and so that's another beautiful thing that I love about this is that it's not just like we're our own little entity. We are a part of a larger community across the nation that we're all really looking to do the same thing. I believe, and that's really just educate and equip this next generation. And that's the part that I teaching that I enjoy the most is hands on, you know, with different skills, you know, for and everything from construction to processing to um, everything, 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 you know, and because we literally we don't farm anything out except tires. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, we pretty much do everything ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I don't mean to be, and we do it well. Right. And that's one of the things I would like to help to equip people with is, okay, it doesn't have to look like a third world country. There is tools out there and there is education that you can get to really do it well so that it's not so frustrating to you. Mm-hmm. Because if you're doing it like a third world country and all of a sudden it's winter and you got a snow coming down and you got a rainstorm coming in or you got wind blowing and your chickens are out all over the yard and it's not a pleasant that's mm-hmm. that's a very unpleasant experience. Yeah, we've seen that show. What is that show that they come and rescue them? And I can't yes. remember the name. Oh, of it. yes, I you know what I'm talking about. about. So you see mind. those, but those situations are real. They Again, are. I mean, and they even know, happen on a very secure homestead, right? You know, I mean, that's just life. But we would like to help kind of mitigate that stress for people, you know, and give them proper tools and proper ways in which to go about those things and. Um, yeah, so that's that's really the goal with this. And we'll just keep working it until God tells us to move on or until he takes us away. You know, I don't know, you know, so every year is just another new year. And um, we've incorporated that now into our new brand, which we're real excited about. So, um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Okay. And what what that means. <laughs> so our, our, because we are always together and teaching together, I really felt like we needed to kind of bring that to a, oh, like a hub, right? You know, um, we weren't just East Tennessee Alliance. We're Steve and Sandy. We do a lot of teaching on a lot of things. We teach on marriages. We teach on relationships. We teach on finance. We also teach on homesteading, right? So I felt like I needed to, because he says I'm a squirrel, I needed one place for everything to land. And so that's kind of when we came up with this idea of, well, we are the brand. So we've created a new website. Well, I haven't. Little plug to Liberty Type Company who's created our website. And um, under that website, we have five different pillars. And those pillars are what we teach on. So health, adventure, mindset, sustainability. And there's one more. And I can't think of it right off my head. Anyhow. Uh, Oh, legacy. And along with all of that, that's cultivating a wild crafted life. So the more we can cultivate in our life, healthy relationships, healthy ideas about money, 
healthy ideas about sustainability, um, proper mindsets that surround adventure and living life to its fullest is all encompassed in that brand. Now, is the website ready yet? Not yet. It's uh, We're in the final stages right now. So I'm doing a little bit of tweaking on things. And then I'm hoping within the next week or two, it's going to actually be out. There's kind of like a little placeholder right now for it, just at stevensandy.com. Uh, but eventually it will be there and it will house the East Tennessee Homestead Alliance, all the workshops that we'll be doing, the retreats that we'll be doing here on our own homestead. Uh, we're getting ready to hopefully put in a high tunnel next year. So we're hoping to get some stuff kind of situated here on our homestead so we can begin doing them throughout the year and not just at the festival time. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Just give me a, a sample of um, some of the workshops or retreats that you're thinking of. Sure. So we've, in the past, we've done what we call mother daughter retreats, uh, father son retreats. And so we'll be like a three day themed retreat weekend where it's a time of bonding and there'll be a theme. So they're learning something, they're going home with something and, it, and it's learning on a lot of levels. So it'll be a physical hands-on learning. There's time spent together on relationship and then there's spiritual time in there as well. So they walk away with a depth to them. So we do those. We also, our goal is to start looking into doing some other workshop type retreats where we're actually doing like a weekend of hands-on just whether it's chicken butchering or whether Steve's going to teach, um, you know, a family how to change all the tires on their car and all the oil and, you know, stuff like that. That's just equipping them. So they're not constantly having to outsource themselves. Yeah. Okay. Then I do fitness retreats also. We'll see if we're going to kind of incorporate that back into probably at some point. We'll incorporate that back into the the schedule. Yeah. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. So at the core of all this is this almost 40-year marriage. Tell me, how how do you make that work? That's a long time. <laughs> what is the magic that, that makes it's a, this? It's a simple phrase. Make every day count. Yeah, that's and that's what that's what we do. And so birthdays and anniversaries, I typically forget, but it's not that important because we make every day count. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Every day um, we choose to serve one another and. Um, and we don't do it perfectly. No, you know, um, we choose to forgive. We choose to talk things out. I mean, we have our moments, obviously, you know, but to be able to stand here and say after 40 years, he's still my best friend and we fall more and more love every day. It's really because we made a choice to make every day count. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like it every day, but we make a choice to do that because we know the results that are going to come from that, you know. So, and I tell folks, especially with people that are coming to us for marriage counseling, I says marriage is not hard. Mm-hmm. That myth that you don't understand women and women don't understand myth, it's nonsense. The, the hard part is learning not to be selfish. Yeah. If you're if you're coming into this, well, what can I give to this relationship? And and most of the time people are going to recipient with that and give mm-hmm. back right. but somebody has to initiate that mm-hmm. and personally i believe in the way things work is god is initiator people are responders Hus- uh, fathers are initiators children are responders husbands are initiators wives are responders mm-hmm. and i it's a very harmonious um thing when you see it work mm-hmm. and i'm not saying that one is better than the other i just saying There's an order to things of how they will work. Mm -hmm. I think just understanding that creative order by design and stop trying to fight that. If we could all get on board with that creative design, there's a lot of harmony there. There is. And and it's like a woman is the most powerful force on the universe, on the planet. A woman can make a man do what another man can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, just simply by that design of influence Mm -hmm. and they can either choose to use that wisely or they can use it selfishly Mm -hmm. and you have at your disposal (laughs) the ability to to make a great man because men only need 
<laughs> Aside from our fragile egos, we're not very complicated. <laughs> all we need is food and tell us how great we are and the other thing, and it's all great. <laughs> But when a woman recognizes that, and I, it's 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 incredible what can the things yeah. that can happen when you work harmoniously like that. Yeah, yeah. And where a man has to be sensitive to numerous things, <laughs> I, I can push the same button twice and not get the same result. <laughs> Uh, but well, being sensitive to that, yeah, to, to yeah. her needs, her protection, her yeah. um, security. And that just goes back to make every day count. Right. Right. You just today, what am I doing to make every day count? We don't have to think about it anymore. You know, um, I actually have a little sign up on my kitchen thing that says make every day count um, just because that truly is our mantra, you know, and it's not just with each other. It's it's everywhere. Everything. It's with everything you do. Make today count. I want my dash. The dash that goes on my uh, my stone, I want that to count. You know, I want all those days to count. Yeah. Just going back, did, was that something from the very beginning that you both realized? Is it something you've carried through? Is it something you've learned along the way? You know, after being, you know, you've been married a long time. So you know, at the beginning when we're younger, it's sometimes not as, you know, you don't get all that sometimes. So, so is that something that's evolved to you living this way with each other? Or is that something that you, especially Steve, you probably, you, you seem to kind of recognize you were a little older and you had a lot going on. Um, and did you realize that early on about making each day count? Yes. I did only because I, even though I grew up the way I did, I always knew very securely what I wanted out of a relationship with my wife. And I'd grown up, in fact, this Italian family that I worked for in the heating and cooling, and they have a, a beautiful tapestry of how their family functions. And that whole thing is where family is very important. Um, I gleaned from that on how they did that. And I took a lot and applied. In fact, the one little Italian man, his name was Tony Randazzo. He, when he passed away, 1,200 people showed up to his funeral. That's the kind of impact he had yeah. on people. Mm -hmm. And so I gleaned from him, I mean, a lot. And then when we got married and we talked and we would talk for hours and hours until she finally kissed me. <laughs> and <laughs> that, She's trying to shut you up. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> My only goal in life was to be a husband and a father. But one of the things that I realized as, and we talk, and we talk very uh, openly for hours and hours at, um, about what we wanted out of life and and the things that we wanted to do. And I was like, I want my, I want to be more in love with you. And my wife is the only, I, I was in lots of relationships. She's the only person I've ever loved. And um, to start with that foundation and to communicate and to be able to share our hopes, our dreams, our passions, our struggles, our shortcomings, everything all on the table. She knows everything about me and I know everything about her. And we protect that. I really think, um, you know, your question, Jen, like, like, where did this idea come from? Did you grow up with it? Whatever. I think Steve was probably the one that pulled that in more and more, more than likely it was because of what he came out of that for him, it was like, I have to make every day count because he came close to death a lot of times. So there was that, I think there was just something, I don't think it was like a conscious I'm going to make every day count. I think it was just something that rose up within him because of where he came from. And then that just kind of became like his actions. He never like said that to me in the very beginning, but it became his actions. And that's contagious. You know, when we were together prior to being married, you know, as uh, just dating, whatever, there wasn't, we didn't have a physical relationship. So it was all based on 
building that solid friendship foundation. And he truly, every time we were together, made every day count. And then I think at some point he just started saying it, you know, um, and it really just became our secret sauce. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and it's it's terrific. It resonates with, mm-hmm. with you know, from you. Um, so I know that uh, you sent me, uh, Sandy, a podcast that you you guys did, and um, and I loved listening to it. And I I don't know whether you guys are going to be doing a podcast, but I highly recommend <laughs> that you definitely get some of these messages out there. You you have an amazing presence and um, some amazing you know some amazing stories that I think when shared have a huge impact on people. So, so thank you <laughs> for, thank for you. sharing all of that with me. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it's very impactful. So on many levels. <laughs> so, um, so thank you both. Did you, is there anything else you want to share about what, what's going on in your lives or any other messages um, that you want to share? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. outside of just, really the idea of you really can do the hard things if you're going to make the day count. If you want to look back at your life, we're all going to have regrets at some level, right? I'd rather have the regret that I don't want to have the regret that I didn't do something. I want, I want to be able to look back at my life. Like I said, I want that dash on my headstone to represent that we left a legacy and not just once we died, we're, we're doing our best to leave a legacy while we're living. And I think that's where people sometimes can miss out on life because they're just trying to set up their own little kingdoms and not realizing that they can live a legacy mm-hmm. with their people. You know, um, there's, I'll give you one last saying, there's a saying that says, I'll take a bullet for, for my family. And I like to say, but would, would you be willing to change for them? You know, how often are you going to take a bullet? What's the, what's the likelihood what's the of you having to do that? Yeah. And what's the likelihood Good. of, are you willing to become? Are you willing to grow? And become willing, who that person deserves? Yeah. So are you willing to do that? And so that's kind of our our message to people and our, our hope with this wildcrafted life, cultivating wildcrafted life, if really helping people to see that you have the power within yourself to grow. Sometimes it just takes you looking in the mirror. Sometimes it takes you walking back into that prison cell so that you can have that freedom. And we're a testament that it can be done. Life is in the hard things. Yeah. It's yeah. the easy things are just the the mountaintops. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And you're willing to embrace the hard things. And and we not, until the day that we take our last breath, we're still going to be faced with doing hard things. Yeah. And it's not a doom and gloom. It, no, it's <laughs> not. I mean, there is you know, there is life in doing that yeah, hard things. There really is. There's Absolutely. Food. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Absolutely. Is. So, that's our take. Make and every so, day count. <laughs> so we 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 enjoy the fruit of doing hard things, and we know that other folks can too. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks thank you having. so much yes. well, you thank did. you and i'm glad we got to make this happen i was yeah. worried when i heard about the hurricane i, I know right like, oh, no <laughs> how's your uh teeth situation Steve? Oh, <laughs> oh, i heard that about that <laughs> I, it's been a, it was a tough month <laughs> <laughs> yes i know that was a few lessons in that one yeah. yeah oh and then you got covid too oh Yes, I he, I got really sick, couldn't talk, had no voice. Oh, it's been something. Yeah, the last six weeks have been something. And then we have the hurricane now. We had all of our grandkids today. We have 10 of them, but we had six of them over the weekend for three days. And at six o'clock, I said to Steve, I have to go get in an Epsom salt bath. <laughs> I'm not going to make it <laughs> to the podcast. <laughs> no, you did. You guys did amazing. Thank you so much. And you just sent Sandy, just send me a picture, whatever picture okay. you want. Actually, I know you sent me some in the past, but whatever you want to. I'll send you new ones. Yeah, okay. we had a branding shoot done. So I'll send you oh, one nice. or a few okay. of them that you could pick from. Yeah. And uh, send me the link. I Well, it's just, is it just stevensandy.com? Okay. I know it's just a landing page right now, but I'll definitely put the link on the, yeah. um, I probably will launch this in two or three weeks. So I'll, I'll let you know. It's usually awesome. launches on a Monday morning, 5.00 AM. Um, but then it's out there and then I do a promo that Monday as well, um, on a few of the social media sites. So 
Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Excellent, guys. Thank you. Thank yes. you. I'm excited to hear what happens and see what happens. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can have a we have a recap, right? After we get some more things. Yes. No, definitely. Definitely. Well keep in touch. Let me know, you know, what's going on. So I definitely <laughs> want to see some of these retreats and stuff like that. So yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. Go have a good night. I will talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Nice meeting you, Steve. Right. Nice meeting you, <laughs> Take care. Bye. I hope our Agritourist podcast prompts you to think more about where your food comes from, whether it be your vegetables, fruits, meats, and even those sweet treats. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with someone you think may truly benefit from or be inspired by it visit us at agra-tourist.com. Until next time. As we are learning from many of our farmers and entrepreneurs, strong connections help propel our visions. Through my interview with Lisa Chase from the University of Vermont Extension and Vermont Tourism Research Center, I was connected to an exciting and new organization called the Global Agritourism Network, or GAN for short. The global network is made up of agritourism stakeholders from around the world. They include farmers and ranchers, researchers, educators, community planners, policymakers, agricultural service providers, and tour operators, among others. It is currently free to join, so if you have any interest in agritourism, check them out at agritourism.eurac.edu slash GAN or just Google Global Agritourism Network. The link will be in our show notes as well. You never know, this global network may help you take your agritourism vision to the next level.